Hi everyone, welcome to or welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me here again today. Last week we spoke about the tragic kidnapping of Lee Matthews and if you haven't seen that I will link it somewhere up here for you. But today we're going to talk about an unidentified and unsolved crime story of a serial killer named Bible John. And this all took place in Scotland in the late 1960s. So if you would like to hear how this mysterious and infamous man got his name, then let's get into it. Intended for mature audiences only. But like I said earlier, this is a man of mystery and we don't actually know who he is. But nonetheless, he still killed multiple women. And let's get into our first victim. On the 22nd of February 1968 in Glasgow, Scotland, Patricia Docker, who was 25 years old at the time and an auxiliary nurse, stayed in Glasgow with her parents and her son, who was around four years old at the time. Patricia was a very beautiful lady. She was not very tall, but she was slim, had dark hair, had dark eyes, and was said to just be a lovely all-rounded lady. So generally, Patricia, who was a nurse, she would work the late shifts, but on this particular night, she had the night off. So she decided to go out with her girlfriends and just have a really good time dancing and just partying up the night. So Patricia got ready, she put on some makeup, and she put on a yellow woolen dress that she wore with a jacket which was navy blue and had fur on the outside like where the hood was and she kissed her son goodbye and told her parents that she was off to the majestic ballroom so patricia and her friends head over to the majestic ballroom but for some reason they didn't end up staying there or they didn't actually go inside and they ended up going to a place called Burrowland. and this may have been because on thursdays there's a singles night where singles who are over 25 can meet up together and, you know, maybe see if something blossoms from that. And Patricia was not technically single, but she was separating from her husband at the time. Land was not only a place where you could have fun and dance, but it was also known as a place that was quite shady. And it was generally an area or a place that people would go to pick up other people and go back to their houses and sleep with. That kind of place. But we assume that all is well and the night goes on. But on this channel, we know that things do not always go well, at least for the victims, we assume. And that's generally why we are here. But the next morning on the 23rd of February, 1968, a man who was walking to his car noticed as he was walking that there was a mannequin lying right by his garage. So he walks over to the mannequin and he kind of like pokes it. But he soon realized after he poked the mannequin that it's not. It was actually a body. And he thought that it was a body of a man. So he calls the police. The police are like, okay, it's probably some guy who overdosed. They did head over to the body, but they only came a few hours after the man had called. When the police got there, they did notice that this was actually a body of a female. And they collected evidence around the scene and took the body to the morgue where the body could be looked over. The pathologist at the time identified the cause of death to be strangulation with a ligature. So something was tied around her neck and used to strangle her. So they thought maybe it was a belt or something that the perpetrator used as a means to kill the victim. The victim had also been struck around the head quite a few times. So she had a lot of damage to her head. But this was not determined as the cause of death. Like I said, it was strangulation. Some sources said that the pathologist said that she was sexually assaulted. But some sources said that she wasn't. But she was found completely naked, except she had one shoe that was quite close to her body. But the pathologist also noticed that this particular victim was on her period because there was a sanitary pad that was found quite near to her body and also he could see that she was on her period. Later on it was discovered that this body that the man found near his garage was Patricia. Later Patricia's handbag and jewellery would be found in a pond near her body. Now police are really stumped because they went from door to door to door and they asked everyone who was like around the vicinity if they heard anything and there was only one lady who said that she actually heard anything Thing, and she heard quotes please leave me alone and this was really in the early hours of the 23rd of february so it could have been patricia walking home from Barrowland the morning of but sadly this case did go cold and it was partially maybe because at the time glasgow was quite ripe in violence but from gangs or just drugs and that kind of violence so police were not shocked by the brutality and the violence of this crime but it was shocking to the residences of the area because this was a woman and it was not the general type of body that police would find. But around a year and a half later, on the 16th of August 1969, which was a Saturday, a lady named Jemima MacDonald, who was around 32 years old at the time, 
was off to Burrow Land with her friends. Jemima wore a black pinafore dress with a white blouse underneath. At the time, Jemima was also married by going through a separation with her husband. And she had two children at the time, which she left with her sister Margaret at her house. So like I said, Jemima was off to Burrow Land and she was dancing, partying it up with her friends. And eventually a man came up to her and started to talk to her. People who were around Jemima and knew Jemima said that he was a tall man with dark hair. Some also say that he had red hair, but they described this man as well-dressed, tall, skinny, and like I said, red or brown hair. Eventually, Jemima and this man left Barrowland to walk outside the club, maybe to walk to Jemima's home, but they ended up leaving this area. So remember I said that Jemima had left her children at her sister Margaret. So obviously her sister Margaret was expecting Jemima to get home that night to take her children back, but Jemima didn't return home. So Margaret was like, okay, maybe she's having a lot of fun, but the night then turned into day and Jemima was still not home to pick up her children. So Margaret left her house and walked to different neighbors to see if maybe they heard anything or they knew where Jemima was. And while she was talking to neighbors, she actually heard some kids talking on the side saying that they saw a body in an abandoned building at the top of the street. So Margaret decides, okay, let me just go have a look. So she walks up to the building at the top of the street and sadly, she sees her sister lying face down in the building. Jemima was found lying face down, partially clothed, so her stockings were lying next to her body, as well as her shoes. Her body was taken away, and the autopsy determined that she was dead around 30 hours from the time she was discovered. She had been beaten, but her cause of death was strangulation with her pair of stockings. They also did find semen on her pair of stockings. Jemima was also on her period at the time as there was a sanitary pad found near her body. Because Jemima had gone to Barrowland and there were people there who knew her, they did take note of the man who she was with. So remember there was a slight description of, who, of the man she was with that night. But while police were questioning the people who were at Barrowland that night, they did give a description of this man, but they also say that they didn't know who he was. They said that he had a very strong Scottish accent, but he was not a man that lived in the area because they roughly knew who came to Burrow Lamb or like they would see who was in the area at the time and they recognized people roughly. Obviously, they didn't know everyone that was in the area, but I think someone would have known him from that night possibly. So police did try and continue the investigation with this case, but it went cold very quickly. And then a few months later, around the 30th of October, 1969, a lady named Helen Puttock, who was around 29 years old at the time, went dancing in Barrowland with her sister named Jean Langford. Helen was also newly separated from her husband and she was now living with her parents with her children. So both Jean and Helen were talking to men at the time in Barrowland and the one guy introduced himself as John and he said he was from Castle Milk and he was a builder at the time. Then the other man also introduced himself as John but he was described as tall, well-dressed, a redhead, and with a very strong Scottish accent. Now, John, the well-dressed one, was constantly looking at Helen according to Jean. She said that while John, the well-dressed one, was talking to Jean, he was constantly like giving a side eye to Helen all the time, like looking at her, really, really focused on her. But this clearly didn't bug them too much because around an hour later, Helen and Jean left with the two men outside, so they looked like they were walking home. But on their way home, John, who lived in Castle Milk, said that he actually needs to turn around because he lives on that side. So they were walking in the complete opposite direction. So Castle Milk, the boulder John, leaves, and well-dressed John now continues with Jean and Helen. So they continue to walk, and eventually they get into a taxi. And during the taxi ride, Jean really asks John a lot of questions and she gets to know him a bit better. But then they've dropped Jean off at her house and the taxi driver then continues to take Helen and John to Helen's house. The taxi driver then confirms that he drops John and Helen off at Old Street and he then leaves and he sees them walking down towards Helen's house. So the next morning, a dog walker then walks into an abandoned building and finds the body of a young lady inside this building. And this was a building that was quite near Old Street, like on the top of Old Street. And I've noticed that there are quite a few abandoned buildings in the story. But like I said, this building was roughly less than 50 meters from Helen's house. So when police got to the scene, they saw a body of a partially dressed lady, which they confirmed to be Helen Putter. Helen had been beaten around the head and strangled with a ligature. Helen was also on a period at the time because they found a sanitary pad that was hidden 
under her arm, like in between her arm here. But one of the pieces of evidence that played a crucial role in this case was a bite mark that was found on Helen's leg. And it showed that this perpetrator had two front teeth that were actually crossed over each other like that, which was quite distinctive, which they were now going off. Now, because Helen was with her sister Jean, they obviously wanted to know what Jean saw that night. And Jean said that this man was around 25 to 30 years old. He was tall, red-headed, slim, but dressed very well and had a very strong Scottish accent. But what she said that she noticed most about him was that he continuously talked about the Bible. He was continuously saying things about his beliefs and that he would continuously remind Jean and Helen that he couldn't drink because it was against his religion. Jean also said that this mysterious man made a particular comment that really stuck with her and he said, quote, Dance halls were dens of iniquity and any woman who attended them whilst married were adulterers. And remember, like I said, all of these women that we mentioned previously were all separated and technically still married. So the media got hold of what Jean said and they then pounced on the name Bible John. And the media really pushed that they believed that Bible John's motivation for all of these murders were based on religion. But bouncers that were also questioned in the Borough Hall or Dance Hall said that Jean's description of the man was quite incorrect. They said that he was not as tall as she described. He also had very dark hair, apparently. But if you ever see really ginger hair, sometimes it can look dark, sometimes it can look ginger, depending on the light. Also, if they were in like a hall that was all dancey and moody, would there really be a bright light on this man's head that they could really see the color of his hair? But police tried anything to try and get any sources of information for this case. They went to barbers to see if anyone had cut red hair in a particular style that Jean described John's hair in. They also interviewed over 5,000 men who had teeth, front teeth, that were overlapping. But they came up empty with absolutely no information because many of these men that they interviewed had no likeliness or any kind of similarity to Bible John. So Jean eventually worked with a sketch artist for many hours and they came up with this image which was quite well known and very popular of what Bible John may have looked like. So some people do dispute the validity of how drunk or sober Jean was. Some people say that Jean was very, very drunk the night that her sister went missing, but Jean continuously says that she was sober the night that Helen went missing. Police then said that the sketch that Jean and the sketch artist did together was one of the best and worst things that could have happened to this case. They said that while police were looking into this case, they were only looking at what this man looked like in this picture. So exactly like this. So there was no leeway with what Scottish police were looking for. If this was not the guy exactly, then it was not Bible John. So really it made the investigation very difficult for investigators. A hundred policemen worked on this case and they interviewed over a thousand people regarding any information with this case. A profile was created around the serial killer and Bible John was described by the psychologist as a very charismatic man. He was apparently very fond of attention. He was very persuasive in getting people to do what he wanted them to do and in order to persuade them about his particular belief. They also believed that he was very, very narcissistic because he loved playing this game, kind of like a cat and mouse game with police, because he would not try and hide the bodies. He would love this type of sex game where he would leave the bodies exposed and waited for police to find them. So nothing came of this case until 1996, when a man's body was exhumed who was named John McInnes. And John McInnes was a suspect very early on in this case. But when Jean was asked to identify him in a police lineup, unfortunately, she was unable to determine that that was actually him. So John McInnes was let go. But he then committed suicide 16 years earlier. And with the improvement of DNA, police thought that this would be the best time to exhume his body. So they did. But first they tested the DNA that was found on the stockings of Helen and compared it to the DNA of John's sister, which came back as an 80% match. But then when they actually exhumed the body and they took DNA from John's bones, they then tested that with the DNA found on Helen's stockings and it came back as inconclusive. So some people say that the storage of the semen may have been really badly done and this may have caused the inconsistency in test results. But then it does confuse me how John McInnes's sister and the semen DNA match came as 80% similarity. But then when they tested the actual bones and the semen, then it came back as inconclusive. But now going back to the ladies with regards to their period, I find this a very fascinating 
point of interest in the case because did this Bible John know that they were on their period or was it just a matter of coincidence that they were and the fact that they refused to sleep with him because they were on their period was the reason that they were murdered. So does that mean that there were other people or other women specifically who had to then take John's advances that weren't murdered because they let him sleep with them and let him sleep with them? Quite interesting that all three were in the same condition. But that was the case of Bible John and I hope you found this case entertaining. I enjoy this case thoroughly. Like I always say, I really love Scotland. So this all fascinates me, but I hope that you enjoyed it and I'll see you again next week. Bye.